Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Hope you are fine. We are slowly heading towards the end of the European uh, Development Days 2015. Uh, but I'm very happy to welcome all of you uh, for this discussion round uh, plenary debate on global citizenship. Global citizens can change the world. My name is Tobias Troll. I'm the project manager of DEEP. DEEP is a project of uh, CONCORD, the European Confederation of Development NGOs. It's initiated by the DARE Forum, which is the working group of CONCORD on global citizenship, development education and awareness raising. And we are very happy to host this panel here today. We are very happy that the European uh, Commission, the organizers, put global citizenship as one of the three pillars of these uh, uh, European Development Days, because obviously in the context of uh, the SDG discussions and the universal challenges humanity uh, is facing, we are all facing together, global citizenship and global citizenship education is, we believe very much, a key element to address these challenges. So, this is something we will explore today together with a very interesting multi-stakeholder panel, which we will introduce to you later, and also based on some some interesting good practice examples, um, which we will use to, to kick off in a minute. I would uh, like to thank the co-organizers of this event uh, first. So besides Concord and Deep, which I represent here, uh, Civicus, the World Alliance for Citizen Participation, is, uh, is supporting it and co-organized it. Chin, the Global Education Network Europe, the North-South Center of the Council of Europe, and ALDA, the European Association for Local Democracy. So we really have a broad range of uh, local authorities, state actors, non-state actors, civil society from Europe and beyond who is involved in this discussion. And I think this shows very much also the relevance of the conversation which we are having today. Um, yeah, I have to apologize for Marina Sarli, who was supposed to, to moderate, actually, together with me, this panel. She could not come for family reasons, but my colleague, uh, Hélène de Bessieux, is uh, happy to jump in, and I'm very happy to co-moderate and host you this afternoon, together with her. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this session. Um, before starting and going into the content discussion, I just would like to introduce you the program and also do some technicalities with you. So uh, we're going to have a short introduction, including a movie in a few minutes. And then we're going to go to practice example of global citizenship. We're going to go through two examples, one which is going to be about governmental um, example and one which is going to be about local authorities. So the governmental uh, perspective will be presented by Jean with Eddie O'Loughlin in a few minutes and then Alda with Annick Neff and Anif, Annick sorry, will going to talk in French. So if you need any translation in French, please take your headset now and use the channel 4 for English and 5 for French. After this uh, practices example, we're going to go into an interactive panel discussion. Interactive, why? Because we think, of course, global citizenship is all about participation, and we would like you, audience, to be active in this debate. Uh, therefore, we're going to use the mobile app. Uh, and before starting, I would like to know um, who is familiar with the mobile app already, has downloaded it and used it already in the audience. Okay, really few. Okay, for, so I would suggest that those people will use it as we planned, if it works correctly. And the people who never use it, we're going to do it on a traditional way. So you're going to raise hand, move, and uh, use your tongue to participate. So it's going to be more traditional uh, participation. So um, before, going in this, uh, before going into this video, I would like already to introduce the Q&A. So through the mobile app, you are, will be able to uh, raise questions to the panel and to the different intervention. Um, but we would like also to say that it's not only about question, but it's also about conversation. And we'd like this conversation to happen with you, the audience, but also between the panels and the different uh, speakers. So therefore, I'm just going to take my mobile to show you for the Q&A for people who have never used um, the... Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, so if you go in the mobile app, you're going to have a small icon here. OK, I don't know if I, OK, we see it. You have a small icon here. When you click on it, you're going to go down, scroll down into the interactivity. 
part of it. And every time we're going to use a mobile app, you're going to have to click on the specific widget of it. So we're going to use the Q&A, the word clouds, and the live voting. So for the Q&A, for example, you go into the Q&A session. OK. No, I get it voting. OK. Let's do it again. OK. OK, I get it here. And then you have to choose the room of this session, and this one is A2. So always click on Auditorium 2, and then you're going to be able to ask your question to the audience. We're going to moderate it from here, and then we're going to raise the question to the panelists. So you're welcome to already start using it from now. Thank you, Tobias. <laughs> <laughs> OK. OK, great. Thanks, Elena. So I hope you are technically set, uh, and you have an idea of the program. and. There is a question outside the app already, so... so can you uh, repeat the password, please, so to get into ah. the, uh, Wi-Fi? That's a good point. Uh, I think there is a slide prepared to display the password for this particular room, which you can use inside this room only, I think. Uh, maybe at a point we can show, show this it. slide yes. uh, from the technical side and uh, make it available to all of you. So this was foreseen. I guess it will come sooner or later. Here it is. OK, Auditorium O2 and then EU Dev Days O2. Quite simple. So now, um, well, to, to show you a little bit what we are doing at Deep in order to address this big topic of, of global citizenship, we have prepared a little film which was actually done uh, at one of uh, three global conferences we organized uh, over the last uh, three years. The first two took place in Johannesburg in South Africa and the last one during the World Social Forum in Tunis under the title uh, Towards a World Citizens Movement. And the idea was to bring together um, movements at a local and international level together with NGO actors because we think that there is a, a gap between these two actors, like NGOs, are often uh, um, well not so well connected to movements and vice versa. So we had a very interesting crowd gathering there and uh, discussing on uh, how citizens emancipation, citizen mobilization uh, for uh, to address global challenges uh, could be could be organized, could be done. Uh, and the two questions which are addressed in this video are like, is a world citizens movement actually something which is, uh, which is possible, which we are, should work towards, and why is it needed? So have a look at this film, and I hope it inspires you a bit, and then we move on with the program. So. challenge that faces us in the world today is to build a unity of purpose of the many struggles that we have that are today in silos. We are not uh, relying upon uh, the potential that the world has. And I'm convinced that if we work towards uh, another paradigm and reflect on the ground we are standing on, there will all of a sudden a world movement breakout. We won't create a world citizens movement, but what we can certainly do as all of the people out there is we can contribute our energy to create the conditions that make a world citizens movement possible. For me a world citizens movement is a movement where, where everybody is connected and everybody's opinion is valued. A movement has strategic goals 
and objectives, organization of civil society are entering in a movement, are making movement together. I do not believe that a world citizen movement is possible. I know that it's already going. So yes, number one, a world citizens movement is possible. Number two, a world citizens movement to reclaim the way politics, mainstream politics is exercised and practiced is also possible. And I think the sooner we start listening to this and reading the science of our time, the better, because we'll start reinventing the things that have been broken and fix the meta-narrative. I do believe in a world citizens movement because it's already existing. The only thing that we might bring new to the discussions is how to synchronize our energies to have a faster effect or a faster solution. I certainly believe in a world citizens movement. Uh, I'm not necessarily sure that this is the uh, that what we have right now is a world citizens movement. I think, in fact, we need to be supporting and facilitating the the social movements, the political movements. I think those are the, the people who actually will be leading the transformation. I don't believe that a world citizen movement can work. It's a sort of utopia who at the end reach nothing. I really believe that the people have to fight for something more or less concretely and more or less achievable. It's something that I believe in. It's something that I think is really needed. A movement does exist and that actually we have a need to bring these different movements together. today is a very simple message that captures the imagination of the people of the world. To build a citizens movement to deliver a new world. We really need not to overemphasize our institutional differences. What we need to do is to focus on the issues why those institutions were formed. I strongly believe in a world citizens movement, but if we want a real change, we need the world citizens movement to reclaim the F word, because what the, how come feminism is not part of system change? There is a need for more opinions and more examples, not just for the European world, but also for Africa and South America. On a global aspect, we need to listen. It's very important now that everybody, every NGO has to come into a single movement. This is the time to build new rules, new roles, new alliances and break old barriers. To be more courageous in uh, putting the right words uh, on the right phenomenon, standing up collectively for a system change. All the movements, all the civil society actors to realize that we are striving to one great goal for the better world. People around the world who believe in human dignity and freedom and the same values uh, should stand up for each other. Very ordinary people with extraordinary solutions. Go back to ordinary people, let's learn from them, let's build on that basis and build a grassroots upwards global movement. To open up a different kind of power that exists within us. Every organization in civil society today needs to ask themselves whether or not they are making the impact that really, truly matters. Thank you very much. So after this inspiring example of what civil society incarnation of a global citizens movement might be, might be and uh, an example of what global citizenship can be, I invite Jean with Eddie O'Loughlin to come to the stage. So uh, he's coordinator of Jean, uh, the Global Education Network Europe, uh, which is a network of government agency and ministry working on global citizenship. And he's going to talk about the initiative Peer Review View. So the floor is yours. Thanks. Um, do I have a um, mechanism for the slides? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I believe I have approximately five minutes, so I've been using up some valuable time there. Um, but just firstly to say um, I'm very grateful 
to the Commission and to the other organising um, partners to be able to give you a brief introduction to the European Global Education peer review process. We believe this is a very effective and practical mechanism for strengthening the quality of global education and reach in Europe. Um, Helene mentioned that this is like a government example concerning global citizenship. And I would maybe add to that to say that what this mechanism does is it helps strengthen global education, which then improves the environment for global citizens to inform themselves and to be active and, and to forward their views and, and, and lives in, in that informed way. Um, so I'm looking for the slides. Are, okay. Grand. Um, firstly, I'll just give a very brief um, a few words on Gene itself, so it may be new to some of you. But it's, it's the network of ministries and agencies with national responsibility for global education in Europe. So it brings together 40 plus ministries and agencies, mainly foreign affairs, development agencies, and ministries of education. The European Commission also cooperates very closely with GEAN um, in this sharing of policy learning. But the key thing in common between all these um, ministries and agencies that come together is this interest in global education, global citizenship. How do we go about this policy learning and sharing? Um, there's many ways, but two of the key ways is with our regular round tables. We meet twice per year. We just met in Vienna um, in March. And sitting around the table, as you say, we have 40 plus uh, bodies, and they are updating each other on key developments in this sector throughout the year. The other uh, key flagship mechanism we use is the peer review process, which I'm going to concentrate on a little bit more now. This process has a number of key features. And the first one I would emphasize is that we come with a positive agenda with this review mechanism. It's not about reviewing or um, evaluating for evaluation's sake. It's about reviewing in, in order to improve and increase the quality of global education in any given country. So we refer to the process as being a peer support and a learning mechanism. The reviewers, the international team that comes to review the process or, or to review the work in the country, they are learning also. We come, we refer as critical friends. The key output from this process is a national report, and this is the most recent one on Portugal. It gives an overview of global education in the country at a given time and makes a number of practical recommendations. A little insight to the process itself just to say it's a voluntary process. So key stakeholders in a country decide this is the right time for us to engage in such a process. It takes approximately a year. So, so it's a quite a long process. Um, but key steps in it would be developing agreed terms of reference, an early secretariat visit to begin research and, and ensure everybody is on board an international team visit, which takes about four days, and the development of a report and then a final launch. Just to give you a flavor, um, these are the 10 countries over the last decade that have been peer reviewed. As you can see, they come from the four corners of Europe in the sense that in Cyprus, in, in the far southeast, you then have Portugal in the far west, you have Norway, the far north, and Finland on the other side, and many filling in between. Most recently, we've had Portugal, as I mentioned, and we're in the middle of a process with Ireland. The international team was there in April. What do we do with all this um, policy learning? First of all, I would say is there is a very intense process occurs in the country concerned. So just as an example, in the Portuguese case, the international team met with everyone from 
the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Education, many parliamentary committees like on education, uh, the Development uh, Committee, also the NGO platform, academia, so a very broad range of stakeholders. And the engagement and process among the stakeholders themselves is often referred back to us as being one of the most important elements of this peer review process. I'd also just mention the peer review team themselves, that as I said, it's a learning process for them. So in the case of the recent review in Ireland, we had a reviewer from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs from Luxembourg, from the Development Agency in Belgium, from uh, the National Board of Education in Finland, a curriculum expert, and from the Austrian Development Agency, Austria. So a broad mix, and all these people bring back ideas from this process. Furthermore, the round table that I mentioned earlier, where we bring together 40 ministries and agencies, they equally reflect twice a year on whatever peer review process is ongoing. So the learning do doesn't just stay with the one country being reviewed or the 10 that have been reviewed. There is a, a great practical sharing of learning. Now, I'm conscious of my five minutes, so I'm, I'm going to be finishing up soon. Um, just to mention on the, the Portuguese review as well, this was launched in the National Parliament last October. Um, the opportunity is there to really help strengthen the standing and status of global education work of the national actors with this type of process, with the type of report that comes out, and the opportunity to launch it in, in, with, with key partners, including, in this case, political actors or groups, which was a key aim of uh, the stakeholders concerned. Finally, getting back to quality, there isn't time in, in this type of brief presentation to go into any detail on recommendations or anything, but the type of areas that are reflected on in the peer review include areas like conceptual clarity in every case, cooperation and coordination, maybe leading to a na national strategy, maybe leading to the next one, issues about roles, formal education, non-formal education, and so on. Um, funding levels, funding mechanisms. So there's a big scope there in the context of these reviews to go into great detail to improve quality and to share learning across Europe. Um, I'm finished just to say thank you. And I've referred a lot to these 10 reports. They're all available on the Gene website. So anybody who wants to do a little further reading, they're very welcome to follow that up. So thank you. Thank you, Eddie, for this intervention. I have now uh, the pleasure to welcome Annick Neff, for this uh, mayor of Strasbourg City in France. Uh, she's going to talk us about the application of global citizenship on a really local level in the city of Strasbourg. So welcome, Annick. Ah, yeah, sorry, forgot to say she's going to speak in French. So if you need headset, it's the moment. Merci. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be here to speak on behalf of the Mayoral Office of Strasbourg to speak to you about global citizenship. I think I'm the only one amongst uh, this uh, group uh, having been elected uh, by a local authority, a city. After all, the cities and local authorities uh, uh, certainly fit in very nicely with this debate. After all, they're on the front line when it is a question of uh, implementing the post-2015 um, agenda as well as implementing uh, millennia goals. Much of this relates to what, ha what happens at local level. Energy, water, waste, waste disposal, health, health services, education, which we've just discussed, gender-based uh, policies, uh, biodiversity and uh, sustainability in development into area. So these specific areas require specific expertise. Uh, and these are areas in which uh, cities in general, in my city in particular, very, very active uh, working with citizens. There is a genuine dialogue that has been uh, created between uh, the local authority in Strasbourg and the citizens. 
very recently, we have uh, put education for global citizenship at the heart of our policy pursued in the area of education, targeting particularly young people. Uh, since 2012, we have worked on this uh, through the uh, Strasbourg Club, which is a network of cities created in Strasbourg in 2003. The purpose of that network is to accompany uh, uh, the uh, most recent wave of enlargement of the European Union towards uh, the east of Europe. Thus, uh, we work within a, a network so as uh, to uh, foster uh, uh, human rights uh, and uh, City for You, City for Europe projects. Uh, we benefit from co-financing uh, uh, facilities uh, from the European Union. Of seven uh, countries, or rather seven cities, Dresden, Trigala in uh, Greece, Canas uh, in Italy, Graz in Austria, Lazi in Romania, Stara Zagora in Romania, and Arad in Romania, as well as Strasbourg, are the seven uh, cities uh, which have uh, created a group of 100 youth. They come from all backgrounds and origins and they've been selected uh, regardless of their skills or educational level. That's very important. Our charter, our city's charter, uh, attaches great importance uh, to this uh, project. What are the objectives pursued? We aim at recreating trust between local governmental authorities and citizens, citizens by promoting active citizenship throughout Europe. We aim at uh, disseminating more knowledge about Europe as well as European citizens' rights so as to raise individuals' awareness uh, as to the fact that they are citizens, that they are uh, agents of change in the form of their participation in the life of their city at local level throughout the entire period of the project, we focus upon citizenship of young people, and that is based upon new technologies. So that was the objective. What were the outcomes? We've noted that we fostered exchanges on European-based subjects whilst promoting core values, rule of law, democracy, human rights, we have encouraged participation in the World Forum for Democracy in the form of a round table that's organized each year in the autumn in cooperation with the Council of Europe. And this year will be our third year in organizing this event. So that's a palpable, a tangible outcome, which has been achieved thanks to the project that I have just described. And two activities have uh, uh, been carried out in parallel with uh, the uh, uh, forum, Global Forum meeting in Strasbourg. There we have representatives coming from European cities to join us in Strasbourg. We also invite non-member uh, countries. Kutasi, Libisi, and uh, a city in Russia. They have also sent representatives. Trikala and Dresden have also had representatives sent, and they've uh, sponsored uh, events as well. The point is to create activities at local level, which will be harnessed to the global objective pursued by the project helping youth in particular to develop a European identity and skills related to European citizenship, helping them uh, to understand their local authorities and to work with those local authorities. Now, how are these links forged? They're forged on the 9th of May, the uh, Day of Europe, and uh, the October European Summit. We also organize direct exchanges and meetings uh, amongst youth and citizens at large with European uh, uh, authorities and local authorities. This was done recently in the presence of several European parliamentarians. Uh, 
In the hemicycle, they also ratified a number of the goals uh, which we pursue enshrined in a resolution. So the point is to create direct contacts amongst individuals, drawing youth from very different areas and origins, co connecting them with decision makers and politicians responsible for briefs that will have a knock-on effect upon their lives as citizens in Europe and youth. So at local level, we promote values and activities which are reflected at national and international level as well. Inclusive governance, uh, territorial-based activities, uh, as well as implementation of uh, public-private policies are fostered at local level and are echoed at international level echoed also by many fora, academia, NGOs, into alia. Those of us who are responsible for public policy and international cooperation are aware that these kinds of links are necessary. In other words, you start at local level, and at local level, people try to establish contacts with their counterparts working at, for the same goals at international level. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, uh, Anik Neff, for this interesting example. From Thank you Strasbourg. very much indeed. So I think we now have heard uh, quite different approaches to this big topic of global citizenship, quite uh, interesting, different uh, uh, emphasis on different aspects. Uh, uh, and now we have the chance to explore this further with this uh, great panel here, uh, along two questions, like what is global citizenship? We heard. Uh, Anik speak about values, about making connections between youth in different countries, for example. We had the peer learning uh, example from Chin and the world citizens movement approach of, of DEEP and our partners uh, to promote uh, connections between movement and, and NGOs for systemic change, for example. So I hope the panels, panelists got some, some inspiration or maybe also some critique, some challenging questions. Uh, around these uh, different approaches, and you as well. So you are still invited, and of course, all along the session to use the app to make your comments, ask um, the questions. And uh, we will do this right now with the word cloud exercise. But before, I would just like to introduce you briefly to the panel which we have here. So here we have uh, Ananta. Uh, Durayappa from the Mahatma Gandhi Institute for Education for Peace and Sustainable Development, which is a, a Category 1 UNESCO Institute in, in India. Thanks a lot for coming. Uh, um, Marion Osieyo, and please, all of you correct me if I pronounce your, your names not in the correct way, uh, is here as a selected youth leader. Um, who has applied for this uh, through the European Development Days. So we are very happy to have you here. She's from the UK and she was involved in the creation of a project called the Athena Project, which supports young women and girls from uh, uh, deprivileged uh, areas uh, in the UK to develop their leadership skills. So thank you for having you as well. Uh, David Melua is the director of the National Association of uh, Local Authorities in Georgia. And uh, yeah, he's bringing here the, the local authorities' point of view, also from a, a non-EU country, which I think is also interesting. So thanks for being here. Rili Lapalainen, a uh, good friend and old colleague uh, of mine at Concord, uh, director or secretary general, actually, of, of KEHIS, the Finnish um, platform of development NGOs towards the EU. And uh, Helmut Hartmeier, who is the chair person of the Global Education Network Europe, which Eddie already has talked about. So now, Helen, what are we going to do with this app now, finally? Yes, let's use our fingers, and I'm going to you. I'm going to ask you to use your tongue if you don't have your fingers on your mobile. So for people who are familiar with the uh, mobile app, I will ask you to go to the Words Cloud section to select again the A2 room and to answer the following questions. Which words do you associate with global citizenship? Um, we just ask you, of course, to type one word by one word and progressively, while you're going to type them, they're going to appear on the screen. And from this discussion, we're going to ask the panelists to react on it. So from that moment, it's 15 uh, seconds, you can start 
uh, typing the words you associate with global citizenship. coming we have 17 seconds left more and more words are coming normally words which are the most used will gonna become bigger exactly like participation solidarity please continue okay thank you very much uh, I see we already have quite some words to start the discussion, but maybe for people who didn't have the opportunity to go on the mobile, do you have some words you want to scream in the audience because you see they're not appearing and you would like to reinforce them? Yes, sir. Inclusiveness. 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 Some other words? Speaking. Speaking. Yes, thank you. Okay. No other words? Okay, thank you very much. We're going to... I let you, Tobias. Okay, thanks a lot. So it worked amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have some, some interesting concepts there, all uh, kind of connected to this broad concept of global citizenship. So I would now ask uh, the panel, each one of you, to give us your definition. What, what does uh, global citizenship evoke for you? What is the central concept you would like to, to share with the audience, uh, with the audience here? So, Maybe to start with you, Helmut. Um, I don't know. Just speak. It yeah. works fine. Um, first of all, apologies for sitting in a polo shirt. I admire my colleagues in the jackets. Uh, but coming from an alpine country, I'm rather used to snow and ice than <laughs> to the Gulf Stream heat of, of Belgium. Uh, welcome. Um, <coughs> I attended the UNESCO uh, session on global citizenship education and there was a, a consensus that there is not one single definition so uh, apologies again that I won't give you one single de uh, definition but global citizenship for me is the notion that we are all embedded in globality that almost everything is local it is global and local uh, at the same time and what happens elsewhere uh, concerns us um, I like the word solidarity and hopeful uh, it is a story, uh, hopefully it is a story of solidarity, the story of global citizenship. Uh, the other day a new um, lifestyle magazine was released uh, in, in my country, in Austria, and uh, the name is Ego. Uh, Ego, if I remember my, my, my poor Latin, uh, means I. And uh, this is what I'm afraid of, that greed uh, rules the world and, and greed uh, destroys the planetary uh, boundaries. Uh, it is too many individuals that want to see uh, their dreams and their wishes to be fulfilled, uh, hopefully, uh, they hope, uh, today and uh, at the latest uh, tomorrow. And this stretches beyond the planetary boundaries uh, we, we have. For me, global citizenship is not a new religion. Uh, it is not a, 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 a narrow uh, ideology, but it is, it is an expression of our concern uh, for, and here are the words mentioned, for a democratic society, for an inclusive society, for a peaceful, for a just uh, society. Uh, global citizenship is about our concerns, the concerns about the distribution of, of labor, uh, the climate issue, uh, migration. I think these are among the most relevant uh, concerns uh, we have. It is a, it is a contribution to change. Uh, this word is also mentioned in this, in this word uh, cloud. Change which is necessary and will remain necessary and therefore global citizenship to to finish my, my contribution is not a final destiny or not a final destination, uh, but it is a constant pursuit of personal and societal uh, transformation. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Helmut. Uh, so very strong value base for you and also quite a normative change agenda in a way as well. Uh, really, how uh, would you define global citizenship or what is important for you in this context? I would say that exactly it's every human being has it as a part of the DNA. 
the only thing is that there's a lot of people who don't really use it. They are not really aware about that they really have this, as a, as a by, by nature, they have this role of the global citizenship. And I, I think that's the role how, why we need to really awake the people, really uh, show the, the interest, the beauty, the richness of being the global citizenship and global citizen in the local level at the same time. I think that it's really waking up the people that they are really part of, of this common planet and really trying to use the resources, what they have, being the useful and really one of, of the very important part of the families, of the community, of the environment where you are living. But I, I, be, I do believe on, on that, that we, everyone really has, human being as an animal really has this need to be part of, of the community. And I think that we need each other. We are, like Helmut said, I think that this ego with G, I think it, it could be better to have an echo with C. It would be much better. I, I think that it's really, that's the wrong direction to go. I believe that every human being has the need to be part of, of the family or the bigger group. And I think we need each other as well. So for me, it's really the participation. It's, it's really the action. It's the doing the things differently, doing those jointly really being critical even, trying to develop this nature, this nature, this environment where we are living a little bit better. Exactly one of my, my big heroes, the Robert baden Powell, who, who used to be the founder of the, the Scout Movement, he has said before he died that try to leave this world a little bit better place when you, when you got it, when, when you came there. So I think that this is the message, that we have the responsibility to take the, the, our role as a part of this community together and really make it as, as a better place when you are leaving from here. Thanks a lot. A very strong emphasis on, on responsibility, I, I understand there as well. Um, David, like, do you have global citizens in, in Georgia, or do you think that's a relevant concept for the Georgian society? Yeah, good question. But first of all, I would like to thank two organizers. It's great pleasure for me to be here. The global citizenship, I would formulate how do I understand it. From my point of view, the history or world civilization or human civilization reached a stage when what we do individually in our villages, communities, towns or cities, all our deeds, it has, they have a global impact. So if there is a global impact, there should be a global awareness. awareness. If there is a global issue, there should be a global engagement and participation. And by the end of the day, citizenship is about awareness, engagement, and participation. So per se, the global citizenship exists, and it affects all of us. And in this regard, from my point of view, the cooperation is a key word for global citizenship. It's cooperation between individuals, it's cooperation between large groups of individuals, it's cooperation between local governments and civil society organizations to promote global citizenship across the planet. In Georgia, um, yes and no. We do understand that the world is global and we are affected and our actions affect others. But I would not say that there is a very clear understanding of the term global citizenship in Georgian society. We recognize that we are part of bigger world, but we do not know how to be a active citizens, active global citizens. So there is a lot to be done, and that's why here I present uh, Project Ladder, and it's great opportunity for Georgia because we try to promote education about global citizenship in, in Georgia. It's rather necessary because there is no more isolated places in the planet. It's a global one. If the planet is global, then citizens, citizenship and awareness should be global. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, there is another microphone here, actually, but uh, it's okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think this is really, uh, I mean, a very recurrent question. I mean, not only in Georgia, I think everywhere, like how to make this uh, uh, a relevant reflection frame for people who are, of course, uh, first of all, concerned with their local environment, local life, because this is where they have their routing and their connections and so on. And uh, 
Uh, I mean, this is something we can also observe in, in many countries where there is a, um, a refocusing on national concerns, even nationalism uh, uh, sometimes, which we see in some election results, and which is the contrary to having this, this global mindset. Uh, um, Marion, that's something I would also like to know from you, maybe, because you are working on local citizenship, on uh, supporting local communities. How does this link to these global challenges and uh, global connections and so on? I'll actually explore that question later on, um, but I wanted to really address uh, the concept itself, first of all, um, because I've spent a long time trying to speak to people and identify um, how they conceptualize this idea. Um, and uh, one word that jumps out is um, action from the word cloud. Um, and I think the idea is uh, very normative in the fact that it, it calls for us to um, act on um, ideas um, which promote uh, better integration um, at the local and at the global level. Um, so in essence, it's not just enough to, to want justice and, and tolerance and diversity. You actually, you have a moral responsibility to, um, to act on it. Um, it's what I refer to as positive action. Um, but I think the concept also is a bit more than that. It's also um, positive in action. It's about... Um, critically evaluating um, your position in this world, your identity in this world, and um, how it's linked to, to other people, because um, ethical actions um, do not always stem from um, ethical relations. Um, our world is interconnected, um, both through our, our ideas of what we want from the world, but also um, historic and current inequalities, um, which is essentially why we're all here. Um, uh, to give you an example, um, volunteerism um, interventions, for example, you know, where people go out and volunteer in developing countries, um, that's, that, that's an example of positive action in global citizenship. It's going out there, it's, it's uh, really addressing uh, the, the causes of poverty. Um, but without critically evaluating your position, why, for example, what are the systems that have led to um, this global division of, of wealth and prosperity, and what is my role to play in this, and how can I negatively resist uh, these systems and these structures? Um, I think both of those goes hand in hand. And so, to link back <laughs> to the, the definition, it's not just about... Uh, being a global citizen is not just about positively acting, it's also about positively inacting, looking at your, your position in this world, uh, the relations and the inequalities in this world which link to your behavior, and also trying to actively resist that. I hope that made sense. It makes very much sense to me. I think this is a, I hope somebody took notes. I think there is a, uh, somebody writing the summary. So I think that's a really interesting definition, actually, of, of global citizenship. Uh, and uh, because you link the action uh, also with the aspect of uh, identity, which you, which you underlined. Um, in terms of identity, that's, I think, really a crucial element. I mean, I think we are in history, and there are studies over the last 10 years that uh, it's the first time in history that actually um, uh, rapidly increasing part of the population identifies themselves as global citizens. Of course, the concept is very old. Socrates and Aristoteles already called themselves uh, global citizens, but it always rest, uh, stayed very marginal. Huh? Now we have an uh, increasing, rapidly increasing number over the last 10 years of people who say, yes, I'm a local citizen, I'm a national citizen, maybe I'm a European or whatever, African citizen, but I'm also a global citizen. However, this is not necessarily connected to positive action because you can very well be a global citizen, looking for global business opportunities, for tourism, Facebook friends over the world, and with a very egoistic attitude, for example, what uh, Helmut pointed out. So, Ananta, I would like uh, to know um, from you how this resonates with you, and in particular, what role can education play in this context? Uh, because, I mean, there are several types of global citizenship, but not all of them are necessarily positive. But I guess education for global citizenship is something which aims to influence this you know, in a constructive and positive manner. 
Thank you. Um, I'm going to throw a curve ball to you and say I'll, I'll defer that question to the second part because I think it's more on the implementation. But let me follow on on the discussion of identity because I think it's an important one to further push through. So I'm going to take, I'm really happy to see these words because there seems to be some convergence. I'm going to take identity, talk a little bit about, and then I'm going to bring democracy and bring in a paradox. Because it's not fun if you don't have a paradox, and I think it's, it's nice to have a, a paradox on global citizenship. And then there was a word which came out in the earlier, in one of the video systems, and I think that's also an important. So let me start with identity. Now, you mentioned a, a number of multiple identities. And there was a very classic book written by Amatya Sen, Identity and Violence, in response to what was going on in India with the communal violence. And the whole idea of multiple identities, uh, to be comfortable with multiple identities, to be an example, a gift for myself, I, I identify myself as, uh, the, the, as a Malaysian, who has a passport that allows me to travel around the world. So that's, that, that's the identity I have. I have an identity in terms of a Canadian who lives in Canada and, and in terms of that uh, environment that I have. I am a Hindu, also an identity of Hindu, but I'm an atheist, also as an identity. Multiple identities, but you can see emerging out of that identity is the notion of cognitive dissonance which is very important, an inconsistency in our value systems. And be comfortable with that. And the education systems that we have, and I'll elaborate later, tends to not allow that inconsistency in our value systems. We want to have consistent value systems. And my training as an economist, in when we talk about it, when we do economic analysis, that's unacceptable. Your preference functions have to be consistent. Otherwise, we can't analyze society. But our value systems are inconsistent. And how to be comfortable with that and then to act on that is something that I think is a struggle we are going to bring up. Uh, and, and talking about in terms of systems, uh, so with that, with that kind of multiple identities, uh, there was a notion of interrelatedness. The world is getting much smaller. There's six billion people. Technology has brought us, globalization has brought us so interconnected that if somebody does a little tweak in some little village somewhere in India, it has an implications you know, somewhere else in the world, the so-called butterfly effect. And I'm talking about, this is why complex systems. I, we, we seem to do a lot of our policy analysis based on a very linear, simple system. It's not so linear, it's not so simple. It's complex, it's adaptive, that brings on a lot of sometimes undesirable pro properties in the system. Uh, one example is our education system. It is something that has produced a lot of technology, but it's also in, developed a very predatorial kind of uh, uh, environment where competitiveness uh, to really compete with the others to sort of move ahead. And that is a, an emergent property that came out of the educational system, which I see as a complex adaptive system. And we need to look at um, those. And that complexity then brings the notion of democracy. And the, the paradox, and I'll end off with a paradox, um, and there's no solution yet. So that's why I want to leave it at, with, the, with, the, with the group here. And this comes out, unfortunately, it's not something that, uh, that came out from my own research, but Danny Roderick from Harvard. So he, had, he posed this problem. Uh, he looked at globalization, but from a very uh, economic globalization, but you can do that mapping to the issue that we are talking about here, global citizenship. He said that's a paradox. So he had three variables, globalization, global citizenship, if you might call that, democracy, and sovereignty. And what he showed that you can only get two out of the three. You can get all three. So that's the paradox, and so there's a trade-off issue, and economists just love trade-offs, otherwise we're out of work. So we need to create those, and so, there, so there's these trade-offs that we need to look at. And that makes it a little bit more difficult when we talk about global citizenship and the actions that we want to take. So I want to just throw that, as you might say, a, a curveball in terms of the whole discussion on global citizenship, because there are hard choices to make, 
and it's a very political uh, environment out there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks a lot. This was a very interesting uh, point of view, certainly, and I thank you especially on pointing out the paradoxes and the inconsistencies, because I think there are no easy answer or carved in stone definitions, uh, which is straight on uh, uh, implementation paths or so. We have to embrace these, uh, these paradoxes and work with them rather than uh, hiding them, I, I believe very much as well. So, but you made already references on the challenges of the implementation and so on, which actually will be the second part of this uh, uh, conversation. And I would invite Helen also to bring you and the app again into play. Exactly. And from what I receive already from the Q&A, indeed, the implementation seems to be the tricky part. And this is what we are going to discuss now with the panel. Um, so the second contribution we would like to have from you is for, on this question, and it's the widget called live voting. So you will have to choose between four options that I give you now. So you can only choose by numbers and which number corresponds to an answer. The question first is, what is the best way to be a global citizen? And you have four options. The first one, sort waste and buy local food. Number two, be part of a local transition town group. Number three, donate money to development organizations. And number four, mobilize against free trade agreements. So again, you're going to have 15 seconds, and then I'm going to ask also the audience to vote with their arms for the people who didn't use the app. We can start now. Okay, the results gonna be shown. And the winner is the second one. Be part of a local transition town group with 42, I would say 43% of the voters. Um, I would like now to ask uh, people who didn't use the mobile app, who would vote for the first option? Raise your arm. Okay, one person, good. The second one. Okay, one, two, three, okay, I would say about 15 answers. The number three? <laughs> no one, okay, and the number four? One, two, three, four, okay, I have like 10 answers. So even for people who didn't vote through the mobile app, the second answer is the winner. Thank, thank you, Helen. Um, very, very interesting indeed. Uh, I wonder why nobody from the non-app users wants to donate money to development organizations. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, certainly there was a clear vote for the option to be part of a local transition town group. Um, that's, that's very interesting. We're talking about global citizenship, but it seems it has a strong local dimension for, for many of you. Um, actually, we didn't just brainstorm and came up with these four options. The idea behind it was uh, to have like two different dimensions. The first one is basically local and individual action. The second, local and collective. The third, um, global and individual. And the fourth, uh, global and collective. Uh, so this is not uh, astrophysics, of course, uh, um, but I think it's gives a little bit of an indication and also is, of course, the idea to stimulate the debate with the, with the panel. So I would also invite you to um, react on with this and where you see in the implementation of global citizenship um, the focus should be. Uh, local, global, collective, individual, or, of course, other dimensions you might come up with. So uh, not to go along the line again, anybody who feels directly inspired to react or to answer the question on how to implement global citizenship? Really? Go ahead. Yeah, exactly. I was wondering then which one I should have been voted and I, I couldn't decide. Because that's exactly is the, the situation that you can do all of those at the same time as well. So it, it really means that it's it's so, in somehow it's very, very um, individual decision, but as a, at the same time, it's collectively. It really depends 
Are you talking about whether your your family or your friends or or your whatever you're doing as a part of your your job or something? So I, I think it really depends how deeply these these points are part of your identity. And I, I think that this discussion about this identity is really really crucial because that really shows that you can really be active in every single level and they are not contradictory. And I think that the the key issue is really that everyone should find for the best way to him or her, how to be pa part of that. There, are, there might be some physical uh, limits or something which really uh, somehow don't really give you the space to do all of these, but the time change as well. So in, in one time you can be very active in the global movement against on the free trade agreements, but at the same time you, you can be very active in the local level when you're getting the family and the kids and all of that. So it's also part of your, your life. So it really depends that you can choose. But I think the main important point, and I'm coming back on, on this, my, my DNA point, that it is there in every individual people has that interest on there, but we need, need to give the space for them so that they can find the best way for them to participate. And I th think that that's exactly a very important point, that we need to have the frames which allows us to do that. Uh, we need to have the political frames which really notice that the importance of the global citizenship. And then, of course, we need to have the resources, we need to have the space, we need to have the culture of doing these, these things. And we need all of, all of this at the same time, and then we are moving on on the best possible solutions. And I, I think that it's, it's really important also to, to uh, we, why these questions were so good ones, is also that it really shows that the the, the principles, the values, the, the things what we believe are very important ones, you can show that also outside. So it's really about this famous slogan, walk the talk issue, which I think that we, all of us, we really need to do that much more on that. And I, I think really that, that that is really the case, how you can really get something for yourself, but you can really give something for your environment, for your community. So it's in two ways, uh, direction. And, and also the one point what I really would like to add on, on that in these um, crisis times, what we are we are living at the moment, I really think that we it has to be fun as, as well. We have to really take this positive side of this really being the the human beings of, of this planet. We still have a lot of beauty here. We still have a lot of nice things. And I think that we need to remind each other as well that there are still, the life still goes on. We want to have that in the next two or three thousand years to go, but definitely we need to really think about how we are behaving and living there in, in the planet. Mm, thanks a lot, really. And especially also pointing out that obviously it happens both local and global and individual and collective. And uh, I read in a book recently that uh, uh, actually the old slogan of uh, um, think global, act local does not apply anymore in this sense, uh, because it's actually thinking and acting globally and locally for more and more people. But Helen just told me that we get questions in, which is great. Huh? So maybe we can start using them now. Yes, um, it's because, as, a, as I said previously, the question are already into the question of implementation. So we talked a lot about values, acting, identity already, like defining global citizenship is already a tough question. But now I think we're going to get to a really tough one. So it's coming from Anonymous. Um, what is the question is, how to reach a critical mass of citizens to act at local and international levels, and how can we transmit the resulting collective voice directly to political powers and markets? So it's really about, now that we talk about what it is to implement it and to reach a critical mass of people, how do we do that? So we would like to have your, your reaction on this question. Yeah, David. First of all, I would like to react on questions which was displayed and voted by the group. I would agree that all of them, they have got equal importance, but then I do understand why second one was more popular, because local authorities are public administration units which stand closer to local citizens, and that's why when you express your citizenship views, you go to local government. If you are a successful citizen at local level, most probably you will be a successful citizen at global level as well. As to the question, actually, what can be done to 
empower local citizens. First of all, local, it, they should be duly informed about their roles and responsibilities. They should be duly informed about uh, their importance in local and global life. And then citizens should be unified and they should have a unified voice. In societies like my own, Georgian society on post-communist countries, the huge problem is a fragmented local society which when each and every individual tries to realize himself individually, tries to protect their interests individually. And, they, and this phenomenon makes our societies very weak. So in an ideal situation, what we should achieve in societies like Georgia or development countries, we should mobilize local society, inspire citizens, inform them, and galvanize them to be active. In, at local and international levels. Thank you, David. Do anyone else want to? Yes, Ananta, do you have a microphone? Yeah. So let me try to come back to the question you first posed to me on the education system. And related to this focus on the, on the local to the global. The education system we have, education is very powerful. It basically um, kind of provides the, the cognitive thinking process that then you start to make decisions and stuff. So that's a very important tool that uh, we have. Right now, the, the focus on most of our education systems is primarily, I, I say, a very productive uh, or driven approach. Uh, it's, you know, if you look at the education systems around the world, it's very uh, competitive driven. It's about assessment. It's about knowledge, but in a very disciplinary knowledge. Uh, the sciences now, there's even a bigger focus on STEM. Um, and I see that this is really, uh, and I like conspiracy theories. Uh, and in a sense, it's, a, it's, it's this grand conspiracy of really making sure that we continuously produce very efficient cogs in a huge factory line uh, to keep on increasing production efficiency and stuff. <laughs> in, that, in that whole, and so we are so busy with the education system on exams and trying to achieve those exams, and it starts from, it, it, it starts moving, you know, used to be much later, but now even from the time that the kid gets into the kindergarten, it's already starting, and especially in countries like India, you see this. Uh, there is no time to enjoy a childhood. There is no time to think about the next person. It's about bettering the next person. So it becomes a very predatorial mentality uh, mindset. And that goes on and builds up and it becomes quite, uh, quite a dangerous uh, situation. That's where we find ourselves. So how do, you, how do you bring in the notion of empathy, the notion of, um, I always thought, uh, there was a philosopher at, uh, at Cambridge, John Rawls, uh, where he developed a couple, and I liked his second theorem, the, the veil of ignorance, where he plays this mind game where he sort of says, if you, have, if you don't know where you're going to be in 10 years, and many things happen, what kind of a system would you like to have? And then he did this with a number of uh, students, and most of them made sure that the worst case was always something that they were always going to be comfortable with because they never knew what they were going to get into. They might be out of a job, they might not have medical or such. So they made sure that that system was put in place so that in case they, did, they don't get into, that, into that, uh, that elite group that we all seem to be finding to get into, the so-called Krugman's 0.1% who wants to own 80% uh, of the global wealth, is that he found that most people wanted to maintain that minimum state. It's called a maxim, maximizing the minimum. Make sure that you have that. So, I, so the, the challenge to the education system is how do we uh, bring this into the, into the processes? The formal systems are so structured, hierarchical, political, it's going to be extremely difficult to work on the formal, but we need to work at it. And, and a lot of, there has been a push on embedding the concepts of sustainability, but more important, the concepts of empathy and peace within mainstream uh, subjects like maths, science, 
I found that a bit surprising, but then I saw a, a handbook from, from the German ministry, and they have already started doing that. Then this move by the Finnish uh, uh, system to go on issue base. So you start off with an example, climate change. And you can sort of link climate change to mathematics because you need to know, the, you need to, uh, and the beauty of that was you know why you're studying calculus, right? And I didn't know why I was studying calculus until I did my PhD. That was really way too late. And I started doing calculus from the age of 12. But I didn't really understand it why and the beauty of it till I was 28. And so for 16 years, it was a mechanical reason I did that. And I was, you know, so we need to change that to see the beauty of it and bring in the notions of peace and sustainability into the mainstreams. Because we're not going to get rid of those. We, those are very important disciplines that we need. So we need to continue with maths. We need to continue with science. But how do we make sure that it's a humanistic education? And that's a new term that has been brought in, and it was highlighted in the, uh, the last education forum in Incheon, in, in Korea. <clears throat> a humanistic education system. Um, thank you. you. can keep the microphone because I, I want to just uh, uh, insist a little bit on this because what you just described is basically a, a radical paradigm shift in, in education because if we consider the, um, the banking schooling system as Paolo Freire describes it, uh, which has been massively pushed over the last decades, in particular also through the Millennium Development Goals, for example, and its focus on, on quantity and access, and especially in developing, so-called developing countries, huh, um, is exactly promoting this kind of values of competitiveness and uh, employability and so on, which you just uh, uh, criticized um, very strongly. So do we need an, an educational um, revolution to, to shift these paradigms and to come to a more value-based uh, uh, education? So if you're asking me, do we need a pair of, yes. Uh, I like revolutions, but not violent ones. Uh, we do come from the Gandhi Institute. Uh, but uh, one of the things that I found fascinating was that we, uh, we basically have developed a huge program on games for learning. Because we find that most kids spend a lot of time playing games. But unfortunately, and I spent a lot of time playing uh, Halo, Assassin's Creed, you know, basically destroying and trying to kill the next guy out there. <laughs> And, and, you, and you get an Andrew Lynch uh, rush when you do that. But there was a, there was a recent uh, game that really was a very powerful game. It was called the War of Minds. Very similar to Halo, so it was very, very graphic um, and a lot of, lot of uh, 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 guns and shooting and stuff. But the roles were reversed. So you were now a civilian, and the challenge is to survive a day in a war-torn zone. And you can choose whether you're a single, you're a family person, and then you're given basic materials. And by the time you play the game and you start moving up the, the ranks, you really understand what war is. And it's not very nice because it tells you, and a lot of people really get wiped out very quickly in the game because they're not able to survive. Mm. And it, it's reverse psychology. Mm, yeah, thank and, you. Uh, and that's what we are kind of also doing a lot in the Institute, developing these kind of games as the informal way of learning, critical thinking, questioning the status quo. Okay, in, uh, in contrast to a reproduction of knowledge as it's still very often uh, practiced in, in educational systems. Uh, Helen, I think we have more questions coming in, so exactly. let's take another one. Yes, uh, we just talked about formal education, so I take this one because it's quite relevant from what we discussed. As formal education is very much embedded in class classic power relations of nation states, shouldn't we focus much more on non-formal education, especially adult education for fostering global citizenship? Mm -hmm. Maybe you can go. <laughs> Helmut, yes, you have a mic. Mm -hmm. Um, first of all, I would like to support a few of the um, comments made. Uh, one is uh, really, and, and I, I would support, we need a good sense of humor when we, when we talk about all these serious issues, difficult in a black hole like this. Um, secondly, uh, we had the 
uh, Vienna Song Contest just recently, and the motto was building bridges. I think building bridges is, 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 is a good motto, and uh, unfortunately, the, 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 the do's point went to a Swedish song called We Are, Hero we Are All Heroes. Maybe we are all <laughs> heroes, but it's, it's the heroic <laughs> implication um, Indian colleague mentioned in, in, in these in this, uh, bloody games. Um, Ken Robinson, um, a, a British uh, research in education, uh, did a longitude research study on uh, what can you do with a paper clip. And five-year-old children came up with up to 100 things they can do with a paper clip. And when we, once we have grown up, we only know that it is to, to clip paper. Uh, so curiosity, yeah, to keep the curiosity alive or to, as you said, wake up people. I'm, I'm a bit uh, scared about waking up people, but, uh, but um, to, 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 to promote curiosity is, 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 is a way. And, and, and this leads me to the issue of uh, the link between formal and non-formal education. We, we had very good experiences with um, NGO workshops and NGO activities uh, together with schools, uh, school linking, uh, opening up schools for the world outside and, and uh, this uh, visits to uh, fair trade shops. And, and there are so many uh, possibilities to introduce um, the, the real world into the, into the formal uh, education system. Johnny Nash came up with a song, There Are More Questions Than Answers, and, and I'm, I'm happy if, if, I, if I go home uh, tonight and, and end up with more questions than I had this morning. And, and if, if education is, is about that, uh, and speaking for, for um, an education network, uh, then, then I think to be critical of education is one thing, but to be in favor of critical education uh, is another thing. To be in favor of quality education, and quality education goes beyond the formal education uh, system. It is uh, non-formal youth education, it is campaigning, it is advocacy work. All that is included and, 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 and can open up spaces uh, uh, for, for learning. And the, and the last image um, I, I like very much is the image of a rose garden. Ed, to see education as a rose garden. Uh, roses have beautiful buds, and, but they need tender care, and you have to be aware of their thorns. Mm. Thank, thank you, Helmut. Maybe, um, Marion, I don't know if you consider yourself as a global citizen, and certainly you are uh, an engaged uh, citizen. Uh, uh, how come? Was it because of your education or despite of it? <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, mainly because of my experience growing up uh, into different and from an economic perspective at least, uh, polar parts of the world. So I was born in Kenya and I grew up in the UK. And so always having that awareness that there is uh, no one fixed uh, presentation or um, existing uh, understanding of how the world is. And so that kind of fostered in me, um, you know, for me, when I was young, I didn't really understand why there was such a disparity in, this, in the world in terms of poverty and equality and all, all these issues that we are addressing in this conference. And so uh, it really spurred me to, to want to act on that. Um, and in the girls, I mean, the girls that I work with, there's this kind of tension between, um, in definitely between non-formal and formal education. So uh, with the program, you know, we provide them with, I guess, what you'd call global citizenship skills, you know, understanding empathy, diversity, tolerance, a need to not only feel uh, something, but also act in it. And then you have this disjuncture in the education system, which is uh, very much focusing on a different type of end. Um, and there is need to, to definitely build um, an education system which values both, both aspects equally. Um, and just to go off on a small tangent, one of the most surprising things uh, 
I, I find about the post-2015 agenda is the fact that you have these three pillars that we're supposed to be working towards, you know, social development, economic development, um, environmental development, but then there's, there's nothing really referring to the ideas and the values that we're supposed to, you know, build this sustainable you know, world from, you know, there's the, the seven pillars, you know, justice and dignity and equality, but really should be mainstreamed into, into this new development agenda that we're working towards because ultimately we're, we're not doing this for <laughs> something objective, we're doing it so that we can relate better to each other. Um, and it, I mean, that's just a reflection from a high level point of view of, of how, global citizenship is, is viewed, really, from my perspective. Mm. Thank, th <laughs> th thanks a lot. Uh, I mean, of course, I think, like, with your biography, you basically, by default, a global citizen. Uh, um, but actually, I mean, I always wonder how people actually g get this awareness at, at a point in their life. Because, of course, there are many who, who don't, uh, and uh, often it's not the formal education, uh, but some experiences which, which actually happen along the, along the road of the encounters and the, the things we, we do and, uh, uh, in our lives. I already get signals that we should slowly wrap up. Uh, we don't want to eat up uh, from the next panel, actually, uh, some, some minutes, as, uh, as it was the case with our panel, but we're happy to accept that human rights, of course, uh, uh, had uh, things to finish uh, uh, before we started. Um, so I would like to ask uh, um, the panel just one last round, uh, one minute each, one idea where you think the focus should be from here to make global citizenship a reality. Is it the SDG uh, objective 4.6 or 7, whatever it is, uh, or shall we go to a, a local uh, transition town group? Uh, so where do you think should we continue working to make global citizenship a reality? So maybe Ananta, let's go this way this time, uh, and then Helmut can close. Uh, so you just told me one. Um, Wow. I think experiential learning has to be part of the uh, formal education system. So that's a challenge, uh, but I think it has to be integral in the, uh, in the formal education system. Mm -hmm. Okay, this was one idea and very short, which is great. Uh, thank you, you don't need to continue. But uh, I think we should duly take note of this. Uh, and you say it's a challenge, but of course we know that also we have uh, hundreds of years of history and certainly 150 years of very practical experience in implementing this kind of pedagogics as well, huh? in uh, uh, Frenet schooling or Dick Crowley in Belgium or, or Steiner Montessori pedagogy and so on. And I wonder why this actually is not really entering in the mainstream of our schooling system, which is a kind of absurdity because its efficiency is, uh, uh, is, is proven huh? and it, it actually works. Uh. Uh, but I think we have an advantage now because we have technology on our side. And I'm talking about ICT technology and virtual reality. So I'm really thinking, you know, like a futuristic, but everything you see, I'm a Star Trek fan, but what I've seen is everything we've seen in Star Trek is coming to reality. And, and I'm seeing uh, virtual reality as a way of, it's going to be very expensive to get everybody to experience uh, things that everybody else is experiencing. You want to know what poverty is, you really have to uh, go into India and go into the slums and you really have to understand, but that's difficult for everybody. But there is ways of experiencing that um, in, in different ways. And, and I think we should kind of try to incorporate that within our formal education systems. Mm. Mm. Thank you. So Marion, where shall we go from here? Oh gosh, that's a good question. Um, I think one of the most interesting uh, phenomenons in terms of human behavior is that our world is becoming a lot more hyper-connected, but that hasn't really reduced uh, the, the high degree of intolerance. Um, between, between different cultures and different um, um, geographical communities. And that's because we still exist in, um, we're still divided by you know, political boundaries,
by uh, different realities from a social and economic point of view. And so for me, uh, being a global citizen is really being in touch with that. It's understanding what we're all working towards, hopefully, um, this global space, uh, which enables us to, to um, share the same uh, moral and ethical values, but understanding that we're still existing in uh, physical spaces, uh, which reflect um, a lot of in inconsistencies um, and adequacies, and, and really taking that and linking it to our own individual um, positions in the world. Mm -hmm. Th thanks a lot. Uh, thank you. So local, local authorities' perspective. Uh, yeah. We have to start from Personally, may I would suggest to start from local level, from cities and villages to cultivate citizenship. And these citizenships, sooner or later, we, will transform itself into global citizenship because without a local citizenships, I don't see global citizenship to be active and effective. So that's my point. Thank you. So start from the local to the global. Really? I will start from the global to local. <laughs> so I, I would say that this, this is now exactly the absolutely unique situation in the global, global level. Exactly, I need to say that global level. Meaning the United Nations level, these yeah, sustainable you. development goals, negotiations which are going to hopefully end it positively in September. <laughs> Uh, as you all are aware, one of those 17 goals, one of those is education. And under the education, there are seven targets. And, and exactly this is the only place in the whole document where you're talking about uh, citizenship. So it's, it's really, really important. It's absolutely fundamental information. It's fundamental victory so far for all of us who has lobbied that very, very heavily. But I think that it's a victory for the whole planet. So if we can really have the, some kind of understanding about the power, about the resources, about the motivation, about the beauty of the people to really take the responsibilities and rights in the local, in the regional, in the global level, that is exactly is the power how we can really change. This, this whole manner of, of, of doing things at, at the moment. So I think it's, it's really, really important at the moment to really keep those sustainable development goals. Hopefully all the member states really support those. And after this September, in, in the beginning of next year, we are going to implement those, which means that they, if they will be universal, which is the proposal, it really means that it's not anymore the global from the north to the south, thinking what it used to be. I think it's really changing all everyone's behavior. And this is really the big challenge for all of us. It's this great opportunity. And I really would like to see that as a great opportunity, really to stop for a while and really thinking how we can move on jointly together and, and really live in in sustainable way in, in this planet. Thank you, really. So big hopes on the SDGs. Let's hope they will keep the promises they they are seemingly providing. Helmut, last there, word for you. There are reason for hope, but there are also reason for a critical monitoring because we have seen so many decades of development uh, since the 1960s. Um, but having said that. Um, Many um, considerations and, and concepts with, about global citizenship are driven by projections into the future, and many are driven by fear of the future. And there are good reasons uh, for, for fear if you, if you just think of climate, uh, the climate issue. But an African proverb says, uh, the grass doesn't grow faster if you pull it. And um, if, if, if we feel that, that the world around us is hell, um, then this is even more reason uh, to give and have the courage um, to give the here and now a chance and to keep the little treasures like personal encounters at the core of our future and human development. Thank you, Helmut. Uh, I mean, one of my favorite quotes is from Albert Camus. We have to imagine Sisyphus as a happy person. So, because probably we can never get this stone on the, on the, on the summit or have the perfect state uh, of, of the world, but I guess we just have to keep on trying. 
we are almost at the end, Helen, for yes, the closing. <laughs> exactly. I just wanted to thank you a lot of people. So I'm not going to list them one by one, but of course the speakers, uh, including Annick and uh, I'm, I'm going to say all of them. Okay, no. I mean, ev everybody, all the speakers who uh, have come, the panelists also, the uh, co organizer that we have uh, quoted uh, at the beginning, the EDDs for the logistics, so it includes also the translators. Thank you very much for your help. The reporters and the technician at the back, thank you very much. Uh, and we, the last thing would go also for the audience for your participation. It was great to see that the mobile app was working, and we hope uh, you took the best uh, of it to make this session uh, interesting. Interactive. And then my final word, will, uh, word would go to um, you to invite you to go on www.deep.org where you can find more information about global citizenship education process, uh, really mentioned, and about the partners' action and uh, link to website of the different uh, co organizer of this session. So we thank you again for your participation, your involvement, and we wish you a very good end of EDDs. Thank you all.